Where are you really from? Where are you really from? Where are you really from? Where are you really? Hey guys and welcome back to my channel. This video was supposed to be like a fun and chatty Q&A to break up all of these long ass videos I've been doing this year and uh, <laughs> now it's not <gasps> and it's pretty effing crucial that I explain myself why before we get into the meat of this video. My last video, Racism in Art School, elicited a lot of strong reactions. People were angry, people were sharing their own experiences. It was a whole thing that I was fully braced for before I hit upload. But one of the most overwhelming reactions that I didn't see coming was people's response to me saying, I am white, I'm not a POC. The live chat exploded, the comment section blew up, everyone was either saying, wait, what the fuck, I thought for sure you were a POC? Or, bitch, you're a POC, what are you saying? <laughs> So that like really took me aback. And even though I did respond to some of those comments, I knew that not everyone was gonna see my response. And even if they did, there was no way for me to fully explain why I said what I said in a single YouTube comment. But initially, I didn't feel the need to make a whole YouTube video about it. I just kind of figured I'd squeeze it into this Q&A video because the question, what's your ethnicity, is already something I get asked a lot in real life and online anyway. But Every time I sat down to film and edit the son of a bitch, I kept thinking of more and more things I wanted to say to the point where over half the video was me talking about my mixed identity and the Q&A part felt kind of like tacked on and clickbaity. So after planning, filming, and editing this video twice, I finally bit the bullet and decided to make this behemoth video to just put the whole damn topic to rest. I have a lot to say, and I don't want to cut corners by not saying my whole truth at once because undoubtedly I'm going to get some ignorant comments. And I really, really do not want to have to make multiple versions of this video. I just want to say it, be done with it, and move on. Hence the ridiculous length of this video. Disclaimers. Right off the bat, I gotta address how mixed people, especially mixed with white people, fit into the larger conversation about racism. The issues I'm talking about today are not as bad as the issues full-blooded people of color experience. If we look at racism as a spectrum of bullshit, being mixed is way over on the easy end. This video is not me trying to argue that mixed issues are just as bad as issues faced by dark-skinned people of color. I'm not saying that at all. I am simply zeroing in on a very specific topic in the greater discussion of racism that I have by far the most experience with. And I am focusing almost entirely on my own experiences, by the way. I am sharing my thoughts, feelings, and experiences as a lens for understanding the larger, more generalized mixed experience. That does mean, however, that I did not, and frankly could not, talk about every single aspect of the mixed experience. This video would be like 30 hours long if I did that. <laughs> And I did try to compile as many voices as possible into this conversation, but at the end of the day, this video is not all-inclusive. If you don't see yourself represented in this video, or if I missed a specific issue, or if you want to expand upon an issue I brought up, please share your thoughts in the comment section. This video, just like my last one, is my way of sharing my platform with y'all. Which brings me to my last and most important disclaimer. Please be respectful in the comment section. Please. <laughs> I love you all and I feel very blessed to have such a kind and mature audience. Lord knows I've talked about other touchy subjects in the past and y'all have consistently impressed me with your level of thoughtfulness. I really can't thank y'all enough for that. But um, yeah, let's not break our streak with this video, shall we? Any racist or nasty comments will be deleted. I'm not tolerating that shit. I already know that this video is gonna attract a lot of shitty people and if they wanna dislike the video, fine, that's their choice. But this comment section is meant to be a safe space for mixed people to share their thoughts and experiences and I will do the best I can to keep it hate free. I just need you guys to do your part in staying respectful with one another. I know y'all are more than capable of that. It just, you know, needs be remarked. Anyway, without further ado, here's the video. Me, myself, and I. What I actually am. The one sentence answer. From my dad, I am half Italian, and from my mom, I am another quarter-ish white, mostly Irish and Belgian, and another quarter-ish West African, North African, Middle Eastern, and Turkish. 
So no, I'm not white, or at least I'm not entirely white. So why did I call myself white in my last video? That question I can't answer in a single sentence. I am positive that the mixed people watching this right now already have an idea of where I'm coming from, but just to get everyone on the same page, let's walk it back to the beginning. My lived experience. From childhood to now, I guess, I have lived exclusively in very white neighborhoods, gone to white schools, and have been raised by the white sides of my family. Why just the white sides? Where are your black and Middle Eastern aunties and cousins? Great questions that I wish I had the answers to. That particular branch of the family tree has been a mystery for literally generations. Like, we only just found out 10 months ago that we're Middle Eastern because my mom took a DNA test. Like, that is brand new information to us. If you had asked me a year ago what my ethnicity was, I would have told you the exact same percentages as before, but I would have said I was part Native American, not Middle Eastern. Turns out, my ancestors never ever talked about their family history and heritage because of the racist culture they grew up in, and the only family members who did talk about our past love to lie and weave a good story. So nothing that we know can be taken as the truth. And we can't find out the truth because everyone who did know about our ancestry died decades ago, <laughs> taking all our cultural family history with them to the grave. All of this is to say is that I really have no connection whatsoever with the non-white parts of my heritage, and I doubt I ever will. My stupid ancestors didn't want that information passed down, and good for them, they succeeded. But what they didn't succeed in was keeping their ethnicity off my face. So basically, my lived experience is mostly that of a white woman with one key exception, and that's that I am constantly asked what my ethnicity is. Acquaintances, friends, colleagues, boyfriends, girlfriends, I've had complete strangers walk across the room to ask me point blank, no hello, what my ethnicity is. But like, whatever, I answer them the same way I just told y'all. But does the conversation ever end there? Has anyone gone, okay, cool, thanks for letting me know, bye? No. God, no. It always turns into this larger conversation, which I'm about to unpack for you right now. What's your ethnicity? This question has been the most asked question in my life, second only to what's your name? And it's almost always the first thing they ask me right after they meet me. And I need to talk about this question because on its own, existing in a vacuum, it's a perfectly fine question to ask. Out of the hundreds of people who have asked me this, I've never gotten like a malicious vibe. They all generally seem to be asking out of curiosity and they may even think they're paying me a compliment. Like, yeah, you're so exotic looking, what's your ethnicity? So like on the surface, I know that this is an innocent and more positive kind of question, but after years and years of being bombarded with this question the second someone sees me, I can't help but notice some insidious undertones. Let's first start with the obvious. Why is it that people need to ask me this question the second they see me? Why? People act like it's any old icebreaker, but it's not like they ask that question to every person they meet. So why ask me and why the urgency? When someone asks this the nanosecond they get the chance, it sends a very clear message to me. I see you for your race first, and I care about knowing your race before knowing any other aspects of your identity. It tells me that you saw me, scrutinized my identity, and became so uncomfortable by not being able to categorize me that you needed to ask me this question the second you could. That's the message I receive. And I'm sure that sounds like a lot, but I know this message to be true based on how people react after I tell them my ethnicity. When I answer their question, there are two reactions, one that's immediate and one that's long-term. The immediate reaction that damn near every single person has is to say something like, oh, I knew you were black because of your hair, or oh, I thought you were Latina because of this, or whatever. And the people who guess right almost always look smug, as though they feel like a bad bitch for correctly clocking me. What this reaction tells me is that people are way less interested in my actual identity as they are with their perceptions and assumptions about me. I know they care about my answer to some extent, but really, they just want an excuse to tell me what they think I am, and they want the gold star that comes with guessing my ethnicity correctly. However, my identity is not a game. You're asking my ethnicity when it's not appropriate, and picking apart my appearance like Sherlock Holmes looking for clues is just yet another reincarnation of other historically racist behavior. For people 100 years ago, this wasn't a game. This was like community patrol. Mixed people had to hide their identities because of the one drop rule, which could condemn them in court for having just a drop of black blood in them. How much you wanna bet that's why my ancestors kept quiet? And then there's the long-term reaction. When I tell them my ethnicity, the cat's out of the bag. 
There's no going back from that conversation. Whatever stereotypes or prejudices or assumptions people have about my various ethnicities are now locked in place. Way too often, people will hear me say I'm part black and latch onto that fact as though I'm some dark-skinned monoracial black girl. I've had people right after learning that I'm part black start calling me their black friend or make comments about my normal ass behavior like, oh, you're acting extra black today. Stupid shit like that. They hear me list out my ethnicities, pick the one sliver that stands out to them the most, and start stereotyping me based on their stereotypes of that specific race. The second I answer their question, everything I now do is colored with whatever new lens they choose to see me. I am no longer myself, I am now a caricature of what they perceive me to be. Now, I need to pause and take a step back from this conversation to point out something important. I'm almost positive that some black people watching this video are thinking, oh wow, poor you, it must be so hard having to come out as part black. It must be so hard dealing with tiny microaggressions. Meanwhile, people see my black ass and are immediately racist to me. And to that I say, I totally agree. <laughs> I've experienced a lot of microaggressions thanks to being mixed, but never any like overt hostile racism. I do experience a certain privilege in being able to come out as mixed and not be so harshly treated on site. None of what I'm talking about today is me trying to compare myself to monoracial people of color or trying to throw myself a pity party. Quite the opposite. This is a selfish video of me venting about this shit I've experienced and my general thoughts and opinions on being mixed. Plenty of other mixed people may disagree with some of the things I say here, and that's cool, that's fine. I'm just here to speak my truth, not speak on anyone else's. Anyway, point is, Asking people what's your ethnicity is, in almost every case, a racist question because you're taking a normal ass person and othering them. For example, if you were in school and you saw this girl on the other side of the cafeteria, would you cross the room, tap on her shoulder, and ask for her ethnicity? Or if you worked at a liquor store and were rigging up this guy's bottle of wine, would you ask his ethnicity? No, no you wouldn't because the fuck, that would be so weird. <laughs> and yet, that experience in the cafeteria happened to me in high school. And the liquor store? I saw happen to my mixed friend. So let's do a deep dive into those experiences, starting with what happened to me. I did not know this girl from a hole in the ground. I didn't know her name, we didn't have any classes together, we were basically strangers, and she still made it a point to walk over to me and ask me this. No hi, no introduction, just point blank ask me, what's your ethnicity? So I'm taken aback, of course, because what the hell? But at this point in my life, I had long been used to people asking me this question, so I decided to run a little experiment on her. Instead of telling her my whole ethnicity, I told her, Oh, I'm mostly white, half Italian, and that's it. Nothing more. And there was this tense pause in the conversation because I knew that wasn't what she wanted to hear. I knew what she was really asking. She, like everyone else who's asked me this question, wanted to know if I'm part black or whatever other non-white ethnicity they think I am. She wanted to know if she had correctly clocked me. But I didn't give that to her because I wanted to see if me saying I'm mostly white, which is true, would give her a second to reflect on how rude and weird that question is. Because again, you never do that to a white person, so why would you do the same to me? So in that split second pause, she now had to ask herself, is it worth it to keep pursuing this question? Do I now ask even more invasive questions to a complete stranger to satisfy my racist curiosity? And guess what? That's exactly what she did. She pushed and pushed and pushed me to say my full ethnicity and when I finally caved, oh the satisfaction. She got that smug ass facial expression and said, ah, I knew you were part black because of your hair. That's where you got your hair. And then just fucking walked away. <laughs> All those questions, all that prying, all that tense, awkward interacting, just so she could pat herself on the back for sniffing out the Negro. Good for fucking you. Meanwhile, I get to process that interaction for the next decade because what that conversation told me is, you are an other. You don't fit in. Your identity is under constant scrutiny from every single person that lays eyes on you. A sliver of your ethnic identity that you have no meaningful connection with and probably never will means more to people than your own complete identity ever will. <sighs> Moving on. My friend in the liquor store. So Sarah is half white, half Japanese. We're in the liquor store one day, I'm hanging back while she's in line to buy a bottle of wine when out of nowhere, the cashier asks her, so where are you from? She does the same thing that passed me in the cafeteria did, which is deflect by giving an honest answer that isn't the real answer the person is looking for. Now, side note, some of you guys might be wondering why we bother answering this question if we dislike it so much. Why don't we just say no? The problem is that people don't know that this is a weird question. Again, they treat it like any other icebreaker. So if we say no, we look like the bad guys. Eh, 
Meh, what are you getting so defensive for? It's just an innocent question. I'm just curious. They don't see that question as harmful. So when they get a negative reaction, they have the audacity to feel offended. Us saying no doesn't diffuse the tension. It creates even more tension. So me, Sarah, and other mixed people sometimes deflect because there's a chance that they'll take the hint and back off. Anyway, Sarah deflects and tells him, oh, I'm from New Jersey. And of course, just like in the cafeteria, he continues to press and press until finally she says she's half white, half Japanese. And sure enough, that's what the guy wants to hear. He's satisfied and we can finally fucking leave. Now, here's the plot twist of these stories. In both cases, neither of the people asking were white. The girl in the cafeteria was Asian and the man in the liquor store was Latino. POCs do the same damn shit. Not as often, not as often, but it's important to note that this isn't just a white versus mixed people problem. Monoracial people of color are just as guilty of othering mixed people. But here's the thing that I wanna make very clear. The actual interaction of asking and answering the what's your ethnicity question isn't bad per se. Like I'm not triggered by the question or anything. The problem is the question's frequency. I've been asked this question hundreds of times and I'm going to keep answering that question for the rest of my life. It's nonstop. So while I know that the people asking me aren't trying to be malicious, that these individual experiences aren't inherently harmful, it's the accumulation of these experiences that has really started to grate on me. I'm so tired of being grilled for my race by people I barely know or by complete strangers. I'm tired of having my race be a conversation starter. I'm tired of being someone's ethnicity guessing game. I'm tired of being told by others what I do or do not look like. I'm tired of people stereotyping me based on a sliver of my ethnicity. I'm tired of people choosing to view me as a racial caricature and not as a real multifaceted person. If there's one thing I want y'all to take away from this video is to stop casually asking this question, especially with total strangers. Please, it's not cute. It's not cash, it's racist. And all of you asking, well, what about? Yes, that question isn't always racist. Yes, there are some times where it's fine to ask. Just let me give y'all some advice first. The rules of asking this question. Number one, don't ask this to someone you barely know and especially don't ask this to a stranger. Your intentions might be nothing but chill. You may even think you're complimenting me because I'm so you know exotic and interesting looking, but please don't. Stop it. Take the time to build a fucking relationship with someone before you ask this question. Learn things about the person. Let them learn things about you. Then wait for the conversation to open up organically. Depending on the context, some mixed people will tell you without you even asking. Number two, if you're asking because you want to know if that person is the same ethnicity as you, start with that and then ask the question. There are plenty of good-natured people of color that get excited and hopeful seeing an ethnically ambiguous person because they want to know if they just found kinfolk. That's cool. There's nothing wrong with that. It's actually pretty endearing. But because again, I as a mixed person get asked this by rude people all the time, I'll feel much more comfortable opening up to you if you state your wholesome intentions first. For example, try saying something like, hey, I'm Trinidadian. I was wondering if you are too. Simple as that. You be open and honest with me and I'll respond in kind. Number three, when a mixed person does answer your question, don't start saying things like, oh, I guessed you were black because of your nose or similar kind of comments. Keep that shit to yourself. My ethnicity is not a game. I don't care how proud you are of yourself for clocking me. It makes me uncomfortable. Please stop. Number four, do not use this question and my answer as an opportunity to talk about racism. I don't know you, Greg, and I'm not about to indulge in your need to rant about the problems you see in the black community. Fuck off. Number five, don't treat me differently with this new information. I know a lot of people who think they treated me the same after asking this question, but they didn't. The weird racist comments like, you're my black friend and you sound so black today still came out. Do not fixate on my identity. I am still the exact same person I was before we had this conversation. If you start treating me differently, I'll start treating you differently too. Labels, POC, mixed, biracial, etc. There's a lot of different labels to describe a mixed person. Some are more specific, like Hapa or Wajin. Some are more vague, like mixed or biracial. And at least one term is kind of loaded, which is POC. All mixed people have to, at some point, have a moment of reflection and figure out what to call themselves because while the definitions of these terms overlap a lot, they each have certain connotations that are interesting to explore. Why not call yourself an American? So this section is for all my international non-American people watching this video. This question was asked to me by, I think a Jamaican, I wanna say? person on Instagram. And to be perfectly honest, it took me completely off guard. In a global context, I think of myself as an American, but on a smaller, more local scale, I never even think to call myself American when people ask me for my ethnicity. A couple mixed people have told me that they identify as American and that's totally fine for them, like whatever works, you know? But this question did force me to take a step back and ask 
ask myself, why is it that I, a mixed person in the United States, don't just call myself an American? Wouldn't it be easier? So after a lot of thinking and reflecting, here is my best answer. Even though we are a country of immigrants, and even though we describe our country as a melting pot, that is not and has never been the actual attitude Americans have towards one another. If you put a gun to my head and asked me to describe an American, I would not describe this person, or this person, or this person, or this person. No, I would say an American is this, a straight, white, middle-class, able-bodied, blonde Christian with a generous dollop of country spirit you know, American. So why this narrow image? Well, it's not exactly a secret that Americans are really fucking racist. This country's nearly 250 year old timeline is literally just violence after violence after violence. We've got the genocide and exodus of Native Americans, 400 years of slavery, lynching, Japanese internment camps, segregation, police brutality, oh, and literally concentration camps happening right now at the Southern border. And outside the people with literal blood on their hands are the people whose racial violence isn't physical. Think of minstrel shows, racial slurs and the one drop rule and fucking Karens calling the cops on anyone they deem suspicious. We may be a country of immigrants, but we despise anyone who doesn't fit the neat little American box we've created. And that discrimination shows up in our language as well. Only white Americans like the kind I just described get called Americans. Everyone else is automatically othered into an additional label. African American, Asian American, Native American, etc. White is the default, every other shade gets an addendum. The racism that permeates our language makes makes it very uncomfortable for non-white Americans to call themselves American. Because even if, say, a third generation middle-class Latino was walking on the streets minding his American business, some white asshole can still drive by and shout, go back to your country. And it's not just racism that makes the term American feel segregated. The US is a hyper-individualistic country. There's no real sense of community. It's all everyone out for themselves. It's kind of like that scene in Pirates of the Caribbean where they have to vote for the next pirate king and everyone just votes for themselves. Like, it's, it's literally that level of ridiculous. Anyway, when you combine American individualism with American racism, you get a country full of people who don't even want to call themselves American. For people of color, calling yourself an American feels like kind of incorrect. Like white people don't think of you as an American. You don't have the same rights and privileges as white Americans. So why would you try to claim a title that excludes yourselves? You'd rather call yourself black, Hispanic, Korean, biracial, mixed, or whatever the fuck you are, just because those labels feel more authentic to you. And on top of that, we have the white Americans who don't even want to call themselves American because they're too cool and edgy. They call themselves Italian or Polish or 2% Native American because in our individualistic culture, some white Americans don't feel that cultural community even though our entire American culture was made explicitly for them. Plus, identifying as your European ancestry instead of your American heritage has the added cool benefit of sounding more exotic, which is a quality that's become extra desirable in the past decade or two. All of this is to say <laughs> that except for the most nationalistic people, Americans don't really refer to one another as Americans, which is why the question, where are you really from and what's your ethnicity are so prevalent. We have a culture of exclusion. So if a white person asks me, what's your ethnicity? They're not talking about my Americanness at all. They want to know my individual ethnicity. They want to know why I look so different. They want to confirm in their minds if they've clocked a non-white person, someone who exists in the realm of other. If someone asks my ethnicity and I say American, they're not going to accept that answer. They're going to keep pushing because they need to gauge my whiteness in order for them to decide how much respect to give me. I don't bother calling myself an American to these people. I know what they're really asking. I know their intent. Calling myself an American is not going to stop racists from othering or excluding me. I do, however, respect mixed people who call themselves American though, because they have the right intention. If you've lived in the US a long enough time, you should be able to call yourself an American and just leave it at that. But I know in my heart of hearts that this label doesn't really suit me, which is why I prefer to call myself a different label. Mixed versus biracial versus POC. I asked my followers on Instagram what label they define themselves as, and the results were pretty interesting. When I think of biracial, I think of someone who's equally two ethnicities, 50-50. When I think of mixed, I think of someone who's more like myself or my mom who is made up of multiple ethnicities. And when I think of POC, I think of a non-white monoracial person, as well as a mixed person who is at least 50% a non-white race. That's just what I thought. Those were my definitions. Nothing set in stone here. But I asked my followers what label they 
interviews because I had a feeling that there'd be some differing opinions and sure enough, there were. Some people who are 50-50 to ethnicities call themselves biracial, but some call themselves mixed. And it seems like of the biracial people who call themselves mixed, most or if not all of them say mixed because they're more white passing, which in a way almost feels like they're demoting their ethnicity a bit because they know their experience is very different from someone with the same genetics, but looks darker. The same kind of trend happened with the term POC. Some biracial people use that term because they don't really look white, even if they are 50% white. Other biracial people don't use that term because they look more white, even if they're 50% non-white. When it comes to picking a label, looks matter just as much, if not more, than genetics. So I now want to broaden the conversation a bit more to discuss the different factors that go into a mixed person's identity and how those factors sometimes clash. Genetics versus looks. When digging up internet discourse around mixed people, I kept finding this reoccurring idea that one's genetics defines a person. The most common example were people who said things like, if you're 50% black, you're not black, you're biracial. You're only black if you're 75% or more black. Substitute black for any other ethnicity, it's all the same idea. The consensus I've seen all over the internet is that in order to be considered a person of color, you need to be more than 50% non-white. And in order to be considered one race, you need to be 75% or more of one race. And if you're biracial or some kind of 50-50 split, well, it gets complicated. This very simplistic genetics-based argument about ethnicity is convenient. It makes it easier to talk about certain issues like cultural appropriation or who can say the N-word, because if you see someone doing something fishy, you can quickly categorize them and decide what they are and are not allowed to do. The problem is that genetics are really freaking weird and can't be used as the all-powerful method to define someone's identity. There's a ton of other factors that go into someone's identity and what they choose to label themselves as, but let's focus on the most obvious one, looks. Let's look at the biracial twin girls, Marcy and Millie Biggs. Same parents, same genetics, same ethnic percentages, and yet they look completely different. Like, yeah, okay. Once you know they're twin sisters, you can see the similarities, but if you didn't know they were twin sisters and saw them separately, you wouldn't give them the same label. You'd probably look at the darker sister and just say she's black, or like maybe mixed, but primarily black. The other lighter sister, you'd probably say she's mixed, but mostly white. If you were to label them, again, without knowing their genetic percentages, you'd probably only label the darker sister as a person of color. Or take myself as an example. In my last video, people were really taken aback when I called myself white and told me how mixed they thought I was. One person thought I was biracial Latina, another thought I was biracial black. One person in particular called me out and said I was obviously a person of color. These people didn't know my genetics. They looked at me and thought I was a POC, which is something I've been told repeatedly throughout my entire life. But genetically speaking, I am 75% white. By the definitions I described earlier, I would be classified as just white. So when people ask me my ethnicity, expecting me to say I'm biracial or significantly more mixed than I actually am, and I tell them that I'm actually 75% white, people don't know what to do with that information. In the span of a single sentence, I go from a person of color to what exactly? As much as we wish something as concrete as genetics could define who is or isn't a person of color, it's really not as great a gauge as we tend to think it is. We judge people based on their looks first, and then we ask the what's your ethnicity question to get evidence for our assumptions. This puts people like myself in a really sticky situation because the label we'd assign ourselves based on our looks is not the same label we'd assign ourselves based on our genetics. My mom has a fun way of solving this problem for herself. She is roughly half white, a quarter black, and a quarter Middle Eastern. In terms of looks, she's very pale, has pale blue eyes, and fine wavy hair. But also, she has a broad nose, full lips, defined cheekbones, and hooded eyes. So what does she call herself? A woman of color, not a woman of pigment. The biracial dilemma. Biracial people kind of have it the worst, in my opinion, because no one knows how the heck to define them. They have no genetic majority, and they usually have a very blended look, meaning that neither ethnicity will automatically accept them. Take this girl from TikTok. She's half Japanese and half Nepali, and looks like the perfect blend of both. She, like other mixed people, gets excluded from both groups because she looks too much like the other to fit in. She looks too Japanese to be Nepali, and she looks too Nepali to be Japanese. Most mixed people share this experience. When you look like both, you look like neither. And unfortunately, when you look like a perfect blend, the way people treat you is based entirely on what features they choose to focus on. Take me, for example. I don't think I look very black, but I know when people are focusing on my black traits because they treat me differently than the people who only see my white traits. Like, if white people start saying racist things in front of me, they clearly think I'm white. But if they start looking to me as the all-seeing educator about racism, they clearly see me as black. And 
let's not forget that colorism plays a really large role in whether or not an ethnic group will accept a mixed person. In my interview with Sarah later in this video, she talks about how Asian people accept her more because having white features is considered more desirable. If she was half Asian, half black, you can be damn sure that the Asian community would not so readily accept her. It can be really frustrating and even hurtful to have your identity constantly in flux and feel like you're being excluded from groups that you ought to be a part of. And to make it even worse, some people, in trying to define you, will try to essentially eliminate or revoke a part of your ethnicity just so that you better fit the narrative they're trying to push. For example, Snitchery here on YouTube is half black and half white. And in a video where she addresses black fishing accusations, more on that later, she talks about what it's like having other people try to revoke her blackness. It may surprise you to learn, or may not if you're one of these people, that even after showing you bam, 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 ABC, lots of people will still think that I am fully white. And you know what? That sort of thing does not bother me, has never bothered me. What people think about my appearance in general, just kind of in one ear out the other. It doesn't bother me what people think I look like. It bothers me when people try to tell me what I am. As somebody who grew up as the black friend and then embraced her blackness for four years of college, well, three years, I was in college three years um, before graduating early. <laughs> it's really weird to have thousands of strangers on the internet suddenly be like, no, you're not black. And when you say, yes, I am, they say, no, you're not. It's weird because it creates this feeling of like tribelessness almost, like you feel like you're not a part of any community which is really strange because I know I'm not gonna be seen as white by white people. While black people don't see me as black, white people do not see me as white either. White people who look at me, they can tell I'm not fully white. They can tell that I'm mixed with something, that I am not fully Caucasian, okay? And black people can also tell that I'm not fully black. And both of those things are fine because both of those things are true. However, the term biracial means two races, okay? So when I say I am black and someone says, no, you're biracial, that still means I'm black. It also means I'm white. That's the amazing thing. So my parents took a DNA test and my mom is Irish and English and my dad is predominantly Nigerian. He also, I mean, they both have a lot of stuff sprinkled in there, but those are like the biggies. So I am born of a mother with Irish lineage and a father with Nigerian lineage. My dad is fully black and my mom is fully white. When you put them together, biracial does not become an ethnicity. It means who ethnicities? Isn't that fucking amazing? Math is awesome. Biracial is not a race. It isn't a matter of mixing red and blue and making purple. It's a matter of mixing green and white and getting a lighter green. I would definitely never argue, like I said, that I have an immense amount of privilege. I fit a Eurocentric beauty standard and a lot of people don't know that I'm black. They just don't know what I am. They don't know, or they know, can I talk please? But they don't know what I am. So I don't face a lot of that institutional racism and I would never argue against that. But that also doesn't make me not half black. I mean, that societal circumstance doesn't erase my identity. If I were to conclude this section in a single sentence, it would be, the mixed experience is a clusterfuck. It feels impossible to pick a label for yourself because you get treated like a completely different person depending on the context. We as a society have rules to define who gets to call themselves what, but there are a thousand exceptions to those flimsy rules. And as a mixed person, it's extremely hard to find your identity when that very identity can change or even be revoked at a moment's notice. I have never in my life been able to label myself. People's perceptions of me and the labels they choose to call me change so wildly depending on the context that it's almost like I have to surrender my identity to whoever is examining it in that given moment. And if I try to call myself one thing, like when I called myself white in my last video, I get told I'm wrong. And yes, the woo-woo answer to all of this is, no one has the right to label you and you don't have to pick a label. You don't owe anybody anything. But like, get real. <laughs> That's just not the world we live in. If labels didn't matter, I wouldn't be asked several times a week what my ethnicity is. I'm gonna talk more about my feelings about my ethnicity at the end of this video because it really is so much to unpack. But I'll end this section with this perfect quote that truly summarizes the mixed experience. At least when you look in the mirror, everyone sees the same thing. When people look at me, it's like a personal debate. I tell them my heritage and they decide for me what I am to them. This is my personal experience. Black, white, and in between. Hair, who gets to wear their cultural identity? We've talked a lot about how vocal people are with their perceptions, expectations, opinions, and judgments towards mixed people. Just by existing, a mixed person is going to, at some point, be told by someone else what they think that mixed person can and can't do with their identity. A classic and all too common example of this is the issue surrounding hair. Who is allowed to wear their hair in cornrows or locks? The obvious answer is, of course, black people. Those styles were created and are meant for textured hair. But where do biracial girls fall into this? Are 
are they allowed to wear their hair that way? Let's compare two biracial women, Meghan Markle and Zendaya. Meghan Markle, as far as I know, has never worn her hair in braids or locks. Instead, she keeps it straightened and styles it like white women usually do. So here's my question. What do you think would happen if Meghan one day wore her hair in locks or got her hair braided? How do you think people would react? I am 100% certain that the millisecond a photo of Meghan Markle in locks hit the internet, black Twitter would go off. There'd be all these tweets talking about, oh, look at her clinging to her 2% blackness, or wow, she wants to be a black girl so bad, or she's biracial, she's not really black, only black people can wear that style, etc., etc., etc. But now, what happens when we compare Meghan Markle with Zendaya, another biracial girl, but who has actually stepped out with her hair in locks? Back in 2015, Zendaya wore her hair in locks to the Oscars, and while that alone caused a lot of discourse and drama, I don't remember anyone talking about whether or not she could, as a biracial woman, wear her hair in locks. I don't remember anyone saying that she was out of line, needs to stay in her lane, or whatever. She was celebrated for wearing her hair that way. So what's the difference? They have the same ethnic background, they're both wealthy celebrities, they have near identical skin tones, their natural hair is curly, not kinky, and if anything, Megan's is curlier than Zendaya's. So again, what's the difference? I think one of the biggest reasons Zendaya can get away with dreadlocks is because she has very obvious black features. She's got the bone structure, the chocolate drop eyes, the negro nose with Jackson 5 nostrils. She looks like a light-skinned black woman. When people look at her, they immediately see her blackness, not her whiteness. Megan, I would argue, looks more ambiguous. Like, yeah, she's got the dark eyes and the tawny complexion, but something about her face betrays her white side a bit more than Zendaya's does. All this is to say, I don't think homegirl gets the braids. But to be fair, this is all hella speculation on my part. Megan could step out tomorrow in locks and hoops and be praised for it on black Twitter, I could be wrong. So let's look at a different, more challenging example that did actually happen. Let's talk about former Little Mix singer Jessie Nelson. In 2018, Jessie posted a picture of herself in red locks on Instagram and immediately was called out for cultural appropriation. Now, if we knew Jessie's ethnicity, this conversation would turn into the classic, you need to be X percentage black in order to wear braids, but that's the catch. We don't know her ethnicity. She's never spoken about it. There's no info online. All we know is that her nationality is British, but she doesn't look fully white. To me and most people on the internet, it seems she looks mixed. So by her not sharing her ethnicity, people online couldn't have that percentage conversation, which forced them to ask and answer a much harder question. Where do mixed people fall in terms of cultural appropriation? And just to clarify for a second, it's very possible that Jessie Nelson is blackfishing and the reason she's hiding her ethnicity is so that she can pass as mixed, a little mix. So please don't think this next part of the conversation is me defending her or calling her mixed when there's no evidence. I'm not. I am simply focusing on the conversation that transcends the whole Jessie Nelson dilemma by focusing on the boundaries of cultural appropriation. Anyway, when that picture of Jesse and the Red Locks came out, Georgia Chambers, a writer of Teen Vogue, came out with an article titled, How Being Biracial Makes Me Feel About Cultural Appropriation. Can I Still Be Called Out? She explains that she used to have a very cut and dry definition of cultural appropriation. To my understanding, it refers to the adoption of the elements of a minority culture by a majority culture without giving credit where credit is due. I've been using this definition as foolproof ammunition every time I called out a white celebrity for wearing locks or Braids. But when she was asked to comment on Jesse Nelson, that definition felt a bit shaky. I considered Jesse's new hairstyle to be cultural appropriation, but I couldn't help but feel uneasy about my position on the topic. The rules on who is allowed to wear black hairstyles has been a topic of ongoing conversation lately. Light skinned Instagrammers and celebrities like Jasmine Sanders and Zendaya wear braids and wigs all the time without so much as a hint of backlash. Conversely, despite his mi mixed race heritage, my brother is so pale that people sometimes assume his afro is a joke, running their fingers through it only to find out that he he did, in fact, grow it himself. Sometimes it seems one can only claim blackness to a certain extent, and once you no longer look like a person of color, you also lose the right to claim braids and locks as your own. I'm not denying the importance of making people aware of cultural appropriation. It can be hugely damaging to people of color in terms of trivializing or commercializing their customs and traditions. Part of our judgment of cultural appropriation is, of course, based upon someone's appearance, and whether we deem them worthy enough of taking on a style or tradition of the associated minority culture. I'm dark-skinned enough to make my African career heritage obvious, but there is still an internal worry that I'm not connected enough to this heritage to warrant adopting their hairstyles. She concludes that judging cultural appropriation is more
more about someone's cultural knowledge and cultural connections, a link threading far beyond one's own motivations for wearing locks or cornrows. There's no denying that having box braids made me feel more connected to black culture and that link isn't just a physical one, it's a deeper, spiritual one that you have to appreciate to understand. To wear black hairstyles is to acknowledge its origins and the traditions of our ancestors. In an effort to build a closer connection to my heritage, the next time I decide to rock locks or cornrows, I will acknowledge and appreciate the historical weight they carry. For the most part, I agree with this. I think she's right to point out that one's appearance isn't the best determinant of cultural appropriation or not, and that it's really more about connecting with one's culture. But there's still some holes I can poke in Miss Chambers' argument. For one thing, how much culture does one need to have in order to reclaim that connection? That really goes back to the damn percentage argument again, right? As it happens, I'm very similar to Miss Chambers. In the beginning of the article, she writes, as a mixed race individual who was brought up in a majority white town with little contact with my black family, I've always felt distant from this side of my identity, even while being very aware my appearance would never cause me to pass as a white person. I mean, that quote is almost verbatim what I described about myself in the beginning of this video, is it not? But the key difference between us is that she's half white and half black, while I'm three-fourths white and one-eighth black. I would kill to have more of a connection with my non-white culture. I, I really would. And not for any superficial, trendy reasons, but to actually be able to embrace my whole identity. To be able to connect with the part of me that everyone notices first. But am I allowed to wear my hair in braids and locks to experience that connection in the same way Miss Chambers did? I don't really think so. I wore my hair in an afro in middle school and early high school, and there were a few times freshman year where my mom gave me cornrows. And I'm not gonna lie, it felt really good. And again, not in any kind of like superficial, trendy way. This was 2010, this was long before the Kardashians came onto the scene. No, this went a lot deeper than that. I remember sitting between my mom's legs and feeling like this was right. Feeling like, like the family members I never got to love were there with me. All the confusion about my identity just melted away. My whole life, I've been scrutinized and questioned about my identity because everything about the way I look is ambiguous. But with my hair and cornrows, all that vagueness went away. No one was asking me what's your ethnicity because I finally looked like how people saw me. It was a very self-affirming moment for me. But over time, I gave up on my afro. I was so sick of being constantly teased and picked on for my hair that I said, fuck it and grew it out. And to this day, I've only worn my hair in an afro once since then. And it felt great, like actually amazing seeing my hair so big for the first time in years, but I still wear my hair down. Why? Because I don't really know where I fall in the cultural appropriation argument. A lot has changed in 10 years, and I really don't think I could wear my hair out in cornrows again without being judged and called out. And certainly, when you go online and read discourse about it, people are still kind of divided about whether a biracial person can wear their hair in braids. Have you ever seen anyone defend a 1 8 black person like myself? I haven't. Now, I just told you my personal story, and I'm sure maybe some of y'all might be thinking, well, you clearly do have a need to connect with your culture, so if you were to follow Miss Chambers' argument, then you'd be fine to wear your hair in cornrows. But what if we're talking about a person who isn't me? Ugh, I had a roommate in college who was 15 16 Scandinavian and 1 16 Cherokee. And because she actually knew the name of her Cherokee ancestor and knew a fair amount about that part of her family tree, she 100% believed that she was a person of color. This bitch looks mayo white, Christian girl autumn white, Taylor Swift white, black pepper is too spicy white, 15 16th Scandinavian white. No one in the whole Cherokee nation would claim her, but in terms of cultural connection, she actually knows a lot more about her ancestors than I do. I'm 1 8th black and she's 1 16th Native American. That's only one generation off. So does she get to claim that part of her heritage? Does she get to wear a full Cherokee headdress? This is where I think Miss Chambers' argument gets a little bit flimsy, because it's easy for her, a half-black, half-white woman, to claim her cultural identity. There's a whole 50% to claim. But when the percentages get smaller and smaller, when the generations keep going, when do you essentially lose the rights to that connection? What does that connection have to look like in order for it to be valid? And what happens when you have people like Jesse Nelson whose ethnicity is unknown? What happens when you have white girls transforming their entire bodies to look like a different ethnicity? What happens to mixed people when cultural appropriation is the norm? Blackfishing. 
I think it's pretty obvious that non-white features and styles are very in right now. We've got cornrows, braids, locks, lip injections, butt implants, severe tanning, wearing too dark foundation shades, long acrylic nails, and even the fox eye trend. These are all beauty trends meant for white women to look more ethnically ambiguous and sweet lord are they working. The Kardashians and Jenners have played a huge role in this new fascination and appropriation of other non-white cultures and beauty standards. And even though Kim and the rest of them have been called out left, right, and center for cultural appropriation, Creation, this behavior is still running rampant and in some cases is being taken to the extreme. According to Urban Dictionary, black fishing is commonly perpetuated by females of European descent, white, which involves artificial tanning and using makeup to manipulate facial features in order to appear to have some type of black African ancestry. The general point of black fishing is for a female of European descent to appear of African, Arab, or Hispanic ancestry, some considered to be the equivalent of modern day blackface because it capitalizes off the looks of historically oppressed groups of people by people who come from more privileged backgrounds. Emma Hallberg is a classic example of this. She's a Swedish Instagram influencer who's done everything in her power to look black. And not just light skin black, we're talking raisin in the sun black, except that she's white. She's a very extreme example, but it's a trend that's been cropping up more and more in recent years. It's actually common now for white girls to modify their looks to look more ethnically ambiguous. Most white girls are not trying to pull an Emma Hallberg and blackfish, and I could even argue that most white girls aren't deliberately trying to emulate another race. Maybe I'm giving too much benefit of the doubt, but I think when white girls put on foundation that's a little too dark and overline their lips and pose with their fingers pulling at their temples, I really don't think they're consciously thinking to themselves, oh yeah, I'm looking real Latina today or whatever. I think they're doing it because they see it as any other beauty trend. All the other girls on IG or whatever are doing it, so I wanna give it a try. It looks cute and it's just makeup. I'm not hurting anyone, like what's the big deal? The first big issue is obvious and talked about pretty regularly, at least from what I've seen, and that's the cultural appropriation, vaguely black facing vibes. I don't care how many times Kim Kardashian steps out in braids. She shouldn't be wearing her hair like that, and neither should you, Becky. That's blatantly stealing from a culture that you're not a part of, and it's not cute. And no, tanning and lip injections are not inherently racist on their own, but when taken to the extreme and combined in such a way that you literally don't even look like yourself or your ethnicity, then yeah, that's a big effing problem. But there's a second, more subtle issue that I've barely seen any discourse on, and that's how these beauty trends are affecting light skin and mixed people. Because you see, these trends are all about subtlety. Unless taken to the absolute extreme, a white girl still isn't gonna look 100% black or Latina or Asian or whatever, but she will look mixed. And that has major ramifications for how real mixed people are treated in three significant ways. Number one, mixed people are being treated and assumed white, not because they actually look white, but because white girls now look mixed. All my comments were saying that I was white passing and that I wasn't able to say that. Now, I'm not disagreeing with the fact that I'm white passing. I understand that people might think I'm white, but here's my problem with that. For years, white girls have tried so hard to look like different ethnicities, different people, Middle Easterners, South Asians, and now East Asians with the fox eye trend, especially black people. American culture and white women have picked up on so many fucking things that have made them look less white. And now someone that looks like me can be seen as a white girl when I don't look anything like a white girl. Granted, I have had my nose and I have paler skin than a, a typical Pakistani, but I am Asian at the end of the day. And it's not a big deal. It just sucks that paler POC are now labeled as white people, not because we look like them, but because white people look like us. I've already talked a lot about how difficult it is being mixed because people like to see you as one or the other or neither. You feel like an outcast from every group you ought to be a part of. So to see a bunch of white girls try to look like you for clout is extremely aggravating. This face and all these features you admire come with a lot of baggage. I have been treated weirdly by people of all ethnicities my whole life, and I have suffered a non-stop identity crisis as a result. That's the price I paid. But no, these white girls can just go out with their face painted too dark, with their hair in braids, with their lips overlined, and be praised. They'll never experience the racism, discrimination, and gatekeeping that a mixed person has to live with. They get to go home, wipe off their fake face, and reset. Guaranteed, if the Kardashians stepped out tomorrow with ribbon lips, pale skin, and roller sets, those white girls would have no problem changing their look back to their Caucasian roots. Meanwhile, I and every other mixed girl still suffer the daily bullshit that comes with being mixed. 
Number two, the definition of white privilege has shifted from being something that exists exclusively for white people to now including light-skinned people of color. For those of you who don't know, white privilege is defined as the set of social and economic advantages that white people have by virtue of their race in a culture characterized by racial inequality. It's a term that's used just for white people, yet I'm starting to see people of color use the term to also include mixed people. Now you could argue, well, if you're part white, don't you have white privilege? But the problem with that logic is that white people do not see mixed people as white. They see us as mixed or other. I think people get confused between the terms white privilege and light skin privilege or colorism, which by definition means prejudice or discrimination, especially within a racial or ethnic group, favoring people with lighter skin over those with darker skin. Light skin POCs get treated better than dark skin POCs because of white supremacy, because of this global idea that lighter is better. But... <laughs> Light skin privilege or colorism still acknowledges the fact that you're not white. A light skin or mixed person might have it easier than a dark skin person, but they're not on the same level of privilege as a white person. White privilege is up here, light skin privilege is down here. You could be the palest in the family tree, but if you're not white, you don't have white privilege. But going back to my previous point about white girls looking mixed, it's gotten to the point now that because white girls don't even look white anymore, the definition is being stretched to include light skin and mixed POCs, which is not correct or accurate to the mixed experience at all. <laughs> A white girl trying to pass as mixed is still, at the end of the day, a white girl. She has the privilege to wear whatever ethnicity she wants that day while still reaping the benefits of being white. She'll never experience racism, and if she somehow does because she managed to look that different, she can easily go back to looking white and get back all of her privilege. It's not at all the same as a mixed person who can't go home and wipe the makeup off. So why does this matter? What does all this fluffy talk about privilege actually mean in the real world? Well, it means that once again, mixed people's identities aren't being taken seriously. You can't look at someone who's half white and say they're the same as a whole ass white person because that would invalidate an entire half of their identity. It's disrespectful and racist because you're zeroing in on one part of a person's identity and then saying, that's all you are, that's all I see you as, and that's how I'm going to treat you. When in reality, a mixed person is many different cultures and ethnicities to create one unique identity that should be looked at as a whole. And to make matters worse, by lumping mixed people under the white privilege umbrella, you're essentially erasing and invalidating the very very real discrimination, racism, and general bullshit that mixed people have to go through. You're acting like it doesn't exist, that mixed people live a life just as easy and carefree as a white person's, when that simply just isn't the case. Mixed people already have a hard enough time being acknowledged in any community, so to just blanket statements say we don't have any problems and that we somehow benefit from white privilege is just so profoundly fucking wrong and leads to mixed people being gatekept even harder from the very racial groups we're supposed to be a part of. Number three, mixed people and their natural features are now being accused of being fake white girls. This is probably the thing that infuriates me the most about these fake white girls. There are now so many white girls tricking their audience into believing they're a different ethnicity or that they're mixed that when the cat's finally out of the bag and people find out that they're really white, those followers now associate that look with whiteness and associate that look with dishonesty. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a mixed girl have to make a video or release a statement explaining that they're not black fishing, that they're not white, that what you're seeing is really and legitimate legitimately them. It's actually disgusting how some people act in the comments. They see a mixed person and act all passive aggressive and start making up bullshit like, those aren't her real lips, she clearly got them done, or I don't believe that's your real nose. And it's like, this is who I am. <laughs> this is all natural. This is my grass fed, free range, non-GMO DNA you're looking at right here. But as angry as I get when I see these kind of comments, I can't help but also be on their side. Like they think they're doing the right thing. They think they're exposing a racist, fake ass white girl. I get their intentions, but grilling someone and making baseless claims about someone's identity is not the way to go about it. I'd much rather have someone message me, hey, sorry to bother you, but I was curious what your ethnicity is. I've noticed you fit a lot of beauty trends and I'm concerned you might be blackfishing or something like that. Maybe that isn't the best wording, but fuck it. I'll take some version of that any day over wanna be Kylie like this bitch got. I wanted to address this because everybody's entitled to their opinions, but sometimes you guys really try to reach. So let me put some things in perspective for you. No hate to Kylie Jenner, she's a beautiful woman, but I was born with this face. She bought it four years ago. Bottom line. If you're a white girl and you've been making yourself look non-white through different beauty trends, knock it off. Cut that shit out right now. It is not cute. It is not cool. It is literally making life harder for people like me. There are so many other gorgeous hairstyles and makeup tricks that you can use. Fishtail braids, roller sets, 70s style shags, beachy waves, 
stunning, gorgeous, literally made for your kind of hair. You can wear a cat eye and contour your cheekbones to get that Bella Hadid lifted look without literally pulling at your eyes. You can subtly overline your lips for a fuller looking pout without getting insane lip injections. Beauty is a spectrum. Just because you're seeing non-white features being celebrated doesn't mean that your beauty doesn't exist. So please, for the love of God, stop trying to be what you're not. It's racist, it's ugly, and we're all fucking sick of it. Back to me. Conclusion. My connection to my ethnicity is very strained. On the one hand, people are very quick to tell me that I look black or Latina or whatever, but on the other hand, I have next to no family or cultural connection with my non-white ancestry. I found out I was part Middle Eastern less than a year ago. So while other people see and assume my ethnicity, it actually doesn't play a large role in my daily life. I only really think about my ethnicity when I'm around other people, and even then, it's less about what I think and more about what others think. My whole life, there's been this tension between what I think of myself and what others think of me. When I hang out with my Latino, Asian, or Black friends, I consider myself the token white person of the group, not as another person of color. I know I'm not 100% white, and I'm very aware that other people don't see me as 100% white, but when compared to monoracial people of color, I feel like an outsider. And yet, when I'm around white friends, I'm hyper aware of how I really don't fit in there either. My connection with my non-white ethnicity is minimal at best, and yet I feel so strongly protected protective of it whenever a white person asks me what my ethnicity is. When I'm alone, I'm just myself. My ethnicity is a part of who I am, but it's not what I choose to focus on. But the second other people enter the room, I compare myself to them in order to figure out who I really am. As a result, I inadvertently give other people the power to decide my identity, and because this has gone on my entire life, I have no idea what to think about myself. I've had a lot of phone calls with my mom while making this video, and one of our conversations was about how I think of myself, how I choose to label myself. She said, it doesn't matter what other people think. You look inside yourself and you know intrinsically who you are. And I had to interrupt her and say, no mom, I can't look inside myself because myself is a dumbass. She doesn't know shit. <laughs> What I failed to explain to her in that moment is that that little voice that has all the answers gets drowned out and confused by all the things I've internalized from other people. Like, do I actually think I'm a person of color or do I just think that because that's what people have told me my entire life? I don't know. And to be perfectly honest, this rising trend of white girls either pretending to be mixed or overemphasizing their slightly mixed heritage has made me a lot more insecure about my own identity. Like, remember my old roommate who's 15, 16th Scandinavian? Every time she asserted herself as a person of color, I'd have this moment of panic where I'd think, is that what I'm like? Am I an annoying white girl trying to flaunt a sliver of her ethnicity to be cool? Do other people hate me because I'm trying to claim a space that doesn't belong to me? And the resounding answer that I've gotten from the internet is, Yes, you are, you piece of shit. I'm not kidding. Every time I see a post about a mixed celebrity, I feel personally attacked by the comment section. For example, I saw this post about Halsey, who is, depending on who you ask, about three quarters white, one quarter black, and she was wearing her hair in braids for Time Magazine. And the comment section was full of people making snarky comments like, she be holding on to that 3% black, wringing the life out of that 20%. Can she sit down? I literally only two years ago discovered that she had a bit of black in her role. She's hella white passing. Girl went to a Black Lives Matter protest twice and now thinks she's fully black. Get them braids out of your head, white woman. When I saw these comments, I didn't see them as a reaction to Halsey. I internalized them as a reaction to me. It felt like they were ripping into me. I started thinking, is this what other people think when I tell them my ethnicity? Do they consider me 2%? Does the quarter of my ethnicity not mean anything? Should I act like it doesn't exist and behave strictly as a white woman? Should I not even call myself mixed? It reminded me of when I wore my hair in cornrows as a 14 year old, which made me think, am I a problematic cultural appropriating piece of shit? If other people find out I did that, am I gonna get canceled? Are people gonna shit on me for that? Halsey and her actions and her identity are not the point of this. The real point I'm trying to make is that the discourse surrounding her and other prominent mixed people makes me doubt myself. It adds to all the other words people have said about me and other mixed people and drowns out my truth. It means that no matter how much introspection I do, whatever truth I have about myself is going to feel uncertain. There's always going to be these extra voices criticizing whatever I think I've discovered about myself. And let's say that tomorrow I wake up and magically have my identity all figured out. My identity is not my identity. It doesn't matter what I think, it's what others think at that given point in time. And what others think is subject to change at any given moment, at any given time, for any given reason. Context is the real determinant of my identity. At this point, finding myself feels futile. I can't separate my feelings from the feelings of others, and what do my feelings even matter in the grand scheme of things? What the hell do I do with myself? The only answer I have is to just 
keep trying anyway. Keep having conversations with myself to help sift through the bullshit and find my truth. Because even though I'm a huge pessimist who believes that my identity is for others to decide, I can't keep going on in my life without finding some kind of solace. I need to figure out my identity. Not for others, but for myself. I want to feel comfortable with myself. I want to feel whole and not just a pie chart of ethnic percentages. My identity is constantly shape-shifting, but at the end of the day, it's still mine. And I think it's high time that I started to embrace my mixed identity. So there you have it. This is the thing that has killed me for about half of 2020. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope it was at least a little enlightening or informative, or you were able to connect to it in some way. I don't want people, my audience to feel alienated. Certainly this is a very different topic from what I normally do. So that feels weird, but I hope that you guys got something out of it. I'm not gonna lie, this has been the hardest video I've ever made on this channel. Every single time I sat down to write the script, almost every time I broke down crying at some point because this stuff is really hard on me to think about. It's hard on me to digest and to work through. And I feel like I've had a lot of like very important kind of self-identifying moments in writing this. It was, a, it was a bit cathartic, but it was also very, very difficult. So I hope I never do this again. <laughs> And again, I really, really hope that you guys got something out of it because if you didn't, well, just lie to me. Also, this video is not nearly as research-based as my other videos have been in the past, but I did find a ton of very, very cool articles about being mixed and I have linked them down below. Obviously, there's a work cited for everything that I used here, but there are a whole bunch of other articles that are just kind of fucking amazing. So if you're mixed or if you just want to learn more about this topic, there are essays down in the description that you really should give a read. <sighs> Thank you for your patience. I know this took forever, but again, I was having an identity crisis every time I sat down to fucking film this thing and yeah. But I hope you guys are doing well. Thank you for sticking around. I will see you hopefully very, very soon with a Q&A. I know no one cares about the Q&A, but I care about the Q&A because I need to do something light and fun and it'll be good. I swear it'll be good. Anyway, thank you guys for tuning in. Go listen to Sarah's EP, listen to the song, and um, I'll see you in the next video, guys. Thanks, bye. Light skin POCs get treated Stop. Light skin POCs get treated better than dark skin POCs because of white supremacy, because of this global idea that lighter is better. But I will murder you. But light skin privilege or colorism still acknowledges the fact that you're not white. Oh my god. Why? Shut up. But they're not on the same level of privilege as a white person. White privilege is up here. Light skin privilege is... Oh. Oh my god. It must be like a birthday or something. Why are we doing this? White privilege is up here. Light skin privilege is down here. You could be the palest in the family tree, but if you're not white, you don't have white privilege. But going back to my previous point about white girls looking mixed, that experience in the cafeteria happened to me in high school. And the liquor store, I saw it happen to my mixed friend. Babel, stop eating the plastic. Continues to eat the plastic. <laughs> Bebito, come here. Hi. Come here. <laughs> because it wouldn't be a Biana video without some kind of cat interruption. <laughs> Just to break up a little bit. Baby do me heap though. He's so cute. Oh, he's angry. <laughs> anyway. Where are you really? Where are you really from? I'm so tired of explaining and complaining now. Why do you care? Where I'm really